Good morning, everyone. So first of all, uh, this is my first KeyCon, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, on behalf of EY, we're, we're really, really excited to be able to uh, support events like this. Um, hopefully, uh, you guys have a really exciting time in the next few days, go to a lot of different, different sessions, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, kind of help kick things off. Uh, so I'm going to talk about innovation today, but before I kind of get into it, um, maybe just a little bit about myself. Um, you could probably tell uh, by the accent, but I, I'm not, 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 from, not from the UK, though this is where I live. Uh, I'm originally from the US and actually, uh, actually was, was born and raised in Texas. So I don't know if I'm going to have the best, most visited keynote, but I may be the first keynote speaker at GeekCon from Texas. I don't know. Anybody confirm that? Boom. All right. So uh, what, I work for EY and work for EY for a few years, but you know, deep down, I'm, I'm a software guy. My, my whole career, really, uh, I've worked in software, worked for different software companies, software consulting firms, because um, deep down, I, I just, I'm probably a lot like you guys. I like solving problems. Um, and a lot of what I do and the reason why I, I came to, to where I work now was to uh, uh, go around and, and, and talk to customers, talk to groups of people uh, about not just innovation, but how, how constant innovation, ways of innovation impact the technology all around them, impacts how they do business, impact how their customers uh, want to buy things and do things, uh, and really just, just impact their lives. Um, and so imagine if you do that, like I do, um, you, know, you move around a lot. Um, and I, I said I was born in America, but I've, ironically, I've spent almost no time working there. Um, so you can see down to the left, you've got big techs. If you've ever been to Texas, there is a uh, Texas State Fair with a gigantic 60-year-old, 20-meter tall, very creepy robot uh, that will welcome you to the event. Uh, so this was, I guess, my first foray into technology when I was three. I met big techs. Uh, changed my life forever. So I moved to the UK a couple, twice, actually. Uh, I've also lived in Australia. I've lived in Japan. Uh, and I, I clearly have a thing for robots because that's I showed yet another robot that I saw when I was in Japan. Um, but I guess you know, at the heart of it is um, I've spent a lot of time working with a lot of different cus customers, working in a lot of different markets, um, and I wanted to try to bring uh, some of the perspectives, some of the things that I've learned, and certainly some of the things that I, I talk about to, to you guys today. Because um, I can't talk a lot about deep technology, right? I, I started out as a developer, but I looked at some of the talks that are going on today, and while I'm eager to participate, I see why I was, wasn't asked to run a workshop. Um, some of the stuff I understood, a lot of it I didn't. Um, I think maybe I'm probably more on the motivational side. When I'm not working, um, I train my children in the dark arts of Mortal Kombat. Um, <clears throat> my wife's not a big fan of this little side venture I have, but I do believe that Toddler Fight Club could really catch on. Hashtag Toddler Fight Club. I do expect that to be trending, trending by the end of the afternoon. Um, no, these are my two, uh, two boys, uh, three and eight. Uh, and clearly, uh, I'm going to be, get a lot of letters home from school when they get older, because um, I think they might have some aggression problems. OK, but look, innovation, right? It's all around us. And, and I, I, I wanted to start with something that almost looks a little bit cheesy and greeting card-like, because we hear this. Um, but it, not only is it true, but I think it's even more apparent and even more relevant to the people in this room, right? this audience, the doers of technology, the doers of innovation. We're the ones who make these things. So while terms like blockchain and AI and IoT and deep learning and magic dust, um, these are catchphrases to a lot of people. And you know, most of the people that I talk to are, are business people. Um, they get very excited about it, but we're the ones who actually go deep on it. We're the ones who are trying to figure out how it works and how to connect all these things together. And it's relevant because you know, the types of innovation we're seeing are much, much different than in previous generations, right? 20 years ago, uh, the technology market was just trying to get people to buy personal computers. We were trying to get people to connect to the internet. Um, and th th everything has changed, right? Services have gotten smaller. Technology has gotten more sort of brick by brick like. Um, and what, what's really, really happened recently uh, is, and I think we've, you know, we've all experienced this, but the way that innovation is even adopted is changing. Um, and it, a lot of it's due to kind of, you know, a term I think we throw around a lot called open systems. Um, the, 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 the ready, ready access to the internet, um, the, the, the ability to, to connect and, and pull in new sources of information anytime you want is something that never existed before. And the culprit 
is, you all have them, I have one. It's what I think is the worst named piece of technology of all time, your, your smartphone. I mean, honestly, has anybody actually used their phone as a phone today? I know I haven't, it's probably been weeks. Um, but the ability to access these open systems, app stores, right? I mean, as developers, we know about open development communities and forums, SourceForge has been around forever, but now you've got moms and dads, people who don't really understand a lot about tech, they can access innovation directly. And, and the go-to-market, the, 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 the boundaries, the, um, what you have to overcome to get something out there is, is, is completely flattened now. So innovations used to always come from these huge companies who had huge R&D departments who could market things the way they wanted and get you to consume things the way you wanted. It's been completely flipped on its head. Right now, big companies, and a lot of the companies that I work with, are trying to catch up. They're trying to figure out how to do things on their platforms that small startups, even individual people can do, uh, and are really, really just making massive shockwaves in the market. Okay, so let's talk about some specific bits of innovation, right? Some concrete examples. So this is, if you haven't seen this before, um, and I'm a consultant for a big four, uh, I have to use at least one Gartner slide per presentation. Uh, I think it's somewhere in my contract. But um, so this is uh, what's referred to as the hype curve. So it's not quite like an adoption curve. It's a little bit different, but it, fundamentally, it's pretty simple. Um, most innovations start with what's referred to as a trigger. So a great idea, right? Hopefully, we've got a lot of great ideas in the room today. The great idea usually begets ludicrously high expectations. And along with expectations, uh, hopefully some funding to try to build those expectations. And then over time, um, those expectations eventually come down to reality once people can understand more about what you're actually trying to do, what you're actually building, what the tech piece of technology actually does. And we all find ourselves in the trough of uh, uh, disillusionment. Now this is the dangerous spot. And if you look at the dots on, on the graph, um, you'll see there seems to be a bit of a, a, a log jam at the top in terms of heightened expectations. Most technologies spend the most time somewhere between the top of this curve and the bottom. And this is a, this is a combination of just mismanaged expectations, uh, not really understanding how this piece of technology can actually do anything for anybody, uh, and also um, just a little bit of overall uh, good old fashioned learning curve. So, and I think the important thing to take away from this is that there are uh, a lot of things there, and I think that we have, we as developers, we have an opportunity to do what we can to try to, I think what I, what I think of is flattening this curve out, right? And we want to do this stuff. We want things like artificial intelligence. We want things like blockchain. We want these things to become mature products because we want to build with them. We want to do things with them. We find it interesting. But what can we do to make that happen, right? We're not CTOs. We're not CIOs. We can't make those types of high-level decisions. But well, maybe some of us are. Um, but like I said in the beginning, it's not really about those guys anymore, right? They're almost playing catch up. It's the people in this room, it's the people who actually understand how AI works, how machine learning works, how IoT can actually impact a business. We're the people who are actually going to drive this change through and actually make these things not just point solutions, not just POCs, but real products. Our mission is simple. Break that cycle. Help companies, help our customers, help our bosses and our, and our coworkers understand, um, understand the expectations, manage their expectations. You know, don't let a client just say, I want a blockchain. Help them understand what it can actually do. Help them understand what it can't do. We break the cycle and this is how we break through. This is how we'll find more of us having more time and more access to doing, access to doing those cool things that we really wanna do. And it's important that we do this, right? It's, uh, it's easy to say, oh, it's not really my, my problem, not really my, my responsibility, I'm just a developer, uh, which is not true. Um, because runaway expectations, runaway expectations can kill. Uh, and I'll use an example to kind of walk through exactly what I'm talking about um, when, you, when you look at blockchain. Now, I'm not gonna stand up here and criticize cryptocurrency. It's massively influential and it's done so much to get blockchain as a technology out there uh, on the public stage to the point where uh, you know, it's pretty easy to find a blog that's actually trying to break down how blockchain works. 
to more functional audiences. And um, some of them do a better job than others, but it's always really kind of interesting to try to read those things. So, so kind of walk this through, right? So you're a developer, you want to get your hands on blockchain. So you know what you would normally do. You would start you know, downloading toolkits, start reading how, to, how, how the tech is all put together, start kind of playing around with it. But the problem these days is your boss wants one too. And a lot of times, this is usually where the adventure starts. Because your boss maybe has read that blog, and he's gone to his board, and they've decided, you know what, we're just going to build a blockchain. Don't know how they're going to use it, don't know why they're going to use it, but they just know they want one. And I guess this one will be in Moth. So as, as the doers, right, as the architects, as the developers, we need to try to help them understand what they actually need. And when you look inside what a blockchain is, you know, and I'm not trying to belittle it because it's, it's a really important piece of tech, um, but an actual solution that implements a blockchain is way more layered, way more nuanced than that. And, and we all know this, but a lot of other people don't. The people who get very, well, most of the people in, in business who get excited about this don't understand it at all. So as, as developers, I think our challenge is to not just understand how to code the actual blockchain itself, but to understand a little bit more about the entire solution, right? The presentation aspects of it, uh, the, the, the cloud infrastructure, how, how it can scale, uh, cybersecurity, data security, and data protection. In Europe, those are huge things right now. So really, I mean, for me, it's about bringing it all together, right? Bringing an entire solution and understanding Certainly being more proficient where you want to play, but kind of pushing yourself to step outside of the box a little bit and have a greater understanding of how the entire solution needs to work. Like I said, the, 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 the things that we're doing today, all of the innovations that were on that curve, you know, it's not about inventing the car. We're not trying to reinvent the car or the personal computer, right? That's all been done what we're trying to push to market, the innovations, the technologies that are going to really sort of shape our industry that we're gonna be working on for the next five, 10, 20 years, uh, they're much more nuanced than that, right? We have to do something, I think, way more complicated. Uh, we have to figure out how to get those two things to talk to each other, right? You look at IoT and telematics, it's all about connecting things that already exist and are already in people's lives in ways that enrich them, which, which is quite a, bit, quite a bit of a different problem to have. And I think seeing that wider picture, not just from the whole solution, but also from the broader use cases, is really important. Understanding how these technologies can actually help consumers live their lives better, how it can help companies save money. It's about seeing the big picture, right? Zooming out and understanding the wider impacts of the things we're working with and what they can mean for everybody. So, Quick recap, right? It's, it's about digging into the layers. Any other one of those solutions that you, you find interesting or maybe you're already working with the work uh, with your team today, you have to think beyond the code. You have to appreciate the wider challenge, right? How it's gonna scale, how you're gonna maintain the security of what you're doing. Because at any time, those, those wild expectations around a lot of this stuff in the market, it can really do uh, potentially a lot of damage, but you can also harness that energy. You can harness the excitement that people have for adopting new technology that they don't even understand as long as somebody has their hand at the wheel and they're really thinking about how it all needs to go together. You need to explore real use cases, right? It's, it's, it's weird to ask a room full of developers to consult their clients and their employers around how these things should work, but I think we have to do it because uh, these things are more complicated than they used to be. I could barely teach my parents how to program a TiVo. There's no way they're gonna understand, understand this stuff without a lot of my help. And of course, if you're gonna eat a big sloppy mess like this, use a napkin. You know, your mom taught you better than that. Okay, so fast forward a bit. And, and maybe you're already there, right? Maybe you've already gone deep. Maybe you already understand everything about blockchain or, or telematics or IoT or AI. Maybe you're already working on it now. You landed that dream job, or you landed that dream project, or dream client, and you, you're working on that, that, that piece of technology, that innovation you've always wanted. You're tackling that curve. Game over, right? You're done. Done all you can do. Um, but not quite yet. And if you've ever worked in a call center, has anybody worked at a support desk, actually talked to, talk to customers? Anyone, show of hands? 
Wow, you guys are lucky. Okay, so uh, if you've worked in a, in, a, in a call center, you come face to face very quickly with you know, good old fashioned user error. I mean, we all know if we built anything that interacts with a human being, uh, that humans oftentimes are uh, the biggest, biggest problem with, with building things, with writing code, right? Because humans don't think linearly. We don't think in straight lines. We think in meandering you know, curves and circles, right? And it's not just, unfortunately, we can't just blame it all on the users, right? Because uh, it's also a big problem with teams, with each other. Right? We're all humans, and the way that we work together as teams, uh, it's, it's subject to the same biases, the same nuances, the same complications as the people who want to use the things that, that, that we build. So I guess what I'm alluding to here is it's, it's the third part of what we need to do if we want to break that cycle, if we want to be able to breathe, bring things to market faster, if we want to be able to, 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 to work on, on, on newer and more mature tech. Um, you know, we, don't, we, can't, we, we have to skill up. We have to understand the wider applicability. But we also need to learn how to function better as people, function better as teams. Um, and it's, it's really, really important here, right? Because if one thing we know is that technology moves, is moving faster than we can keep pace with it. And it's been really, really confusing to a lot of people for a long time why two teams that seem to be the same just perform at different levels. And I believe this is something we really have to get to the bottom of. We have to finally solve if we really want to be able to push through. So quick definition, a uh, high performing team. Because I think we've all heard the term. We maybe have been to team building classes and things like that. Um, I actually wrote this definition. I didn't Google it. Um, I saw some definitions and I don't know, they weren't quite right. And maybe this one isn't as good, but it definitely I like it better. So I define it as a group of individuals whose collective performance exceeds the sum of its individual parts. And if you look up a definition of synergy, it's going to sound really similar. But it goes back to exactly what I was saying. You take two teams, two groups of people, same skills, same constraints, same time, same task. For some reason, one team will outperform the other. Why? So I would like to introduce you to the idiots. Now, uh, the guys who helped me put this presentation together warned me that a Red Sox reference was a reach. But I'm going to go with this, even though I don't, probably not a whole lot of baseball fans in the room. So the 2004 Boston Red Sox and our American baseball team, um, they, they ended up winning the, 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 the American League Championship. It's called the World Series. Interesting name. But uh, and basically what happened with these guys was they were a fairly, fairly average team. They weren't expected to, to do all that well. Um, they made it to the playoffs, made it to the postseason. And time and time again, they had their backs against the wall. They had really no expectation of, I mean, the other people had no expectation of them winning. Uh, but they found ways to overcome. They found ways to win. And in the end, they beat their arch rivals, the big bad New York Yankees, who had far more access than them, far better than them on paper. But what made them great, right? It wasn't just, they weren't just, hit, they weren't hitting more home runs at all. They were statistically average. Um, they had the same constraints. They had the same resources as other teams. But what separated them, and if you, if you, if you read any of the, the, the interviews that they did after the season or even during, uh, there were a couple themes that kept emerging when these guys would talk about each other and talk about the team. They kept talking about how much they trusted each other. They kept talking about how bonded they were. They kept talking about this unified, laser-like focus on a common goal which was to win it all. Now, if you've ever seen the movie or read the book Moneyball, and this is a scene from Moneyball, uh, it's basically, it's a, it's a movie written, an American movie written about a book that calls into question a lot of what we conventionally think about as the winning, winning factors, the statistics that mean that baseball teams will perform better than others. Um, and I guess what I'm saying kind of runs in the, in the some level of contrast with that. But I'm not saying numbers don't matter. They, they certainly do. It's just not the whole story. Now, I also have to talk about Google, right? Those are the two things that you really have to do as a Big Four consultant. You have to reference a Gartner picture, and you have to talk about Google. Uh, so I, I've got them both done now. Um, Google did, uh, they wanted to take this problem on that I'm talking about, you know, the, the disparity between otherwise equivalent teams and their performance. So a couple years ago, they published their findings. 
and it was you know pretty pretty remarkable because i i certainly expected a much more conventional conclusion around you know um, better access um, you know but what they found was a very very similar thing to what what i found and what others found when we started looking at the boston red sox the things that teams talked about that consistently outperformed other teams it was not about better burn down. It was not about uh, more years of experience. It was not about working longer hours. I'm sure they had to do all that at times, um, but it was really about the connection that they felt with their team. It was about feeling trust and empowerment. It was about feeling that they could operate in an open environment where they could constructively challenge each other and that they could, they could support each other. And a lot of that came down to the connection that they felt to each other as people. So what about you guys? I would imagine almost all of you work in teams on a daily basis. It's very rare you find anybody in the software industry who doesn't do that anymore. Does it, does it, feel, does it, does it feel connected? Do you, do you feel those connections? Do, do, do you feel yourself sort of living the values that Google found in their study that, that I talked about with the, with the band of idiots? Which, by the way, that's a name that they gave themselves. I'm not calling the Red Sox idiots. So what's a team to do, right? I mean, I'm, say, I'm saying we need to connect. I'm saying we need to be more, more in touch with each other. But at the same time, everything about our industry is pushing us farther apart. The skills we need are more esoteric. They're more spread. So we need to work in distributed teams. And I would imagine most of us, if not all of us, work in some, some form of distributed team across time zones, across borders. And the ability to communicate with each other becomes very, very difficult. And we've, we've created tools to help with that. We have Skype. We have Slack. We have collaboration tools. And, and while those things are very, very good at increasing the level of access, every time you step, take a step away from a human interaction, you lose one degree of contact you have with the people you're trying to communicate with. Whether it's moving from a face-to-face -to, -face to a video conference to a teleconference to a Skype to an SMS or WhatsApp to an email. You, you lose a little bit of that, lose a little bit of that, what just makes the interaction human. You lose the ability to build that trust. So it's about balance, right? We can't all fly to the same office all the time and work in the same building. And we can't all get together and do trust building exercises. So just a few kind of key steps. Um, and I think at some level you, you, got, you probably know this, but it's, it, it's good to kind of just walk it through. First, we have to get the right tools for the right job. That's simple. And I think that's what a lot of us are doing here today, right? We're skilling up. We're learning how to do our jobs better. We're learning new tools, new tricks. Um, any team has to have the right set of components to be able to do their job well. You have to acknowledge the constraints that exist. So when I talk about the fact that we have to use these online collaboration tools, you can't not do that. We need to be able to work where we are. We need to be able to work optimally. But we need to also be very open and acknowledging about what those things take away from us, what they deprive us from. And once we acknowledge those as a team, you have to find ways to be more human. And a bunch of little, it's a bunch of little things, right? And like one by one, they're cheesy, um, but it starts to create a much more sort of just organic ecosystem your team lives in, right? So you know, it's little things like going, logging into your Slack profile and changing that profile photo into the, you know, the one picture that you kind of wanted to use, but maybe you felt was like a little too personal. Definitely needs to be work appropriate. Um, but just anything that just kind of just opens yourself up just a little bit to the people that you work with. Um, it's about, you know, if you want to ask somebody a question, and, you know, it's, it's so easy to send an email from your phone even, um, but to set up a call, to set up a video conference, right? Try to establish a more of that connection that we want to have as humans. Like, we long for it. We, we, we need it. Um, I find it so interesting that we... We see our personal interactions as on a completely different level as our professional ones. I, if I just like WhatsApp my wife all day long, I would not have my pictures of my kids up here, or at least, you know, I would maybe not not see them nearly as much. Uh, it, it's we know we have to treat our personal connections differently. For some reason, we see our work connections as so much more transactional. And if we really want to be able to break that curve, if we really want to be able to take our performance to the next level. It's not about working harder; it's about working better working better with each other, and it's about really trying to bring those two worlds together. Average teams ride the hype curve. High-performing teams break it. Now, I'm not asking you guys to go out in the hallway and do trust falls after this, although that would be amazing. 
Um, but it's about acknowledging that the little things that we do, whether it's scaling up, seeing the big picture, understanding the wider problem, connecting with each other as individuals, building high-performing high performing teams, proper high-performing teams. <laughs> Dig into the full solution. Own it. Understand that you need to be part of the solution. Understand that even if you're just a, a full-stack developer sitting in a, in a remote office somewhere, you need to understand what the things you're working on really are going to do, not just for your client, but for, for, for the market as a whole. It really is on all of us because we want these things to adopt fast, faster. We want them to become real. Keep your eye on the big picture, right? Take in those broader use cases. Start thinking about how when you connect that car to that computer, all the different places it could go. How it can make your life better, how it can make what you're trying to build a little bit more, more, more enriched. But also be mindful, be open, be human. This is how we'll break out. This is how we'll break that, that cycle. And this is how we will break through. Okay, so before I go, I just want to remind everybody, uh, please do drop by the table. Um, we've got some drawings, we've got some, some t-shirts, some, some, some trivia questions, things like that. And enjoy the rest of your time here. Again, I'm so happy you guys could be here today. I'm so happy to be here with you uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.